Hello everyone, I'm Ellie Weisenberg-Kelly, Manager of Public Programs at the Pechanico Center of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, located in Tarrytown, New York. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our virtual educational programs held at Kaikit, the historic Rockefeller family home built by John D. Rockefeller in 1913. Today, Katrina London, Manager of Collections and Curatorial Projects at the Pechanico Center, will present duos in the dining room, paired mice and figures at Kaikit. Katrina will discuss the history of the pendant pairs of mice and porcelain on display at Kaikit and their role in interiors from the 18th century to the present. Thank you for joining us from home and sorry we cannot physically be together today experiencing the breathtaking beauty and grace of this historic home and landscape at Pecanico. We hope you enjoy today's program as well as our future virtual offerings and we can't wait until we can welcome you back in person. For information on upcoming programs, please visit our website at rbf.org slash events. And now here's Katrina with Duos in the Dining Room. Enjoy. Hello and thank you for joining me today. I'm Katrina London, the RBF's Manager of Collections and Curatorial Projects based at the Pecanico Center. It's my great honor and pleasure to be able to share some views and insights into the collections with you all virtually. Kaikit is a 40-room Beaux-Arts mansion perched on the highest hill above the Hudson River, 25 miles north of Manhattan. It was built in 1913 by John D. Rockefeller as a country retreat on his large estate near Tarrytown. Today, a site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation managed by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, it is preserved as a historic home to four generations of the Rockefeller family. Among its many treasures, Kaikit's holdings of ceramics are particularly strong, consisting primarily of Chinese Ming and Qing wares collected by John D. Rockefeller Jr. in the early 20th century and earlier Chinese Han and Tang Dynasty tomb figures as well as German mice and porcelain added by Nelson Rockefeller in the 1960s and 70s. He essentially transformed the dining room into an aviary for several pairs of 18th century mice and birds, which were originally created for the Japanese palace of Augustus the Strong in Dresden. While porcelain wares were first produced most frequently as dining sets or vases, they were later conceived as works of art in themselves to be displayed on pedestals, wall brackets, and tables. Augustus founded the Meissen Manufactory in 1710 and became its main patron. The manufactory produced mainly decorative tableware until 1733, when Johann Joachim Candler was appointed Meissen's chief modeler, and the production of porcelain sculpture depicting human figures and animals gained parallel importance. They were most often conceived as a pair of figures with slight variations, usually a male and a female shown in different poses, settings, or activities. In this way, they function similarly to painted pendants that have been translated into three dimensions. However, due to their rarity and high cost, these objects would have been more valuable than most paintings at the time of their creation. They were highly sought after by art collectors, and they have retained their allure to the present day. Most Meissen figurines are quite small, less than a foot high, and they were often displayed on dinner tables where they could be admired up close, including here at Kaikit, where we have a figure of a shepherd and a shepherdess on the dining room table. Beginning around 1728, Augustus ordered thousands of pieces of Meissen intended to decorate his Japanese palace in Dresden. This included a menagerie of nearly 600 porcelain animals in their natural sizes and colors, which was an incredibly ambitious undertaking for the manufactory. Augustus's gallery of animals was never completed as planned. The king's death and technical difficulties led to the abandonment of the project by 1739. A surviving sketch by his court architect suggests how the animals were planned to be displayed in pairs on wall brackets. Augustus requested that all animals be painted in their natural colors. However, it was too risky to put the largest sculptures in the kilns for another firing without them breaking apart, so these pieces were usually painted with oil paint that did not require firing. The oil paint rarely survived or became discolored, which led to its removal by dealers. We can see that this king vulture at the V&A still retains some of its original oil paint. 
The closest precedents came from 17th and early 18th century China and Japan, as exemplified by these matched pairs of Arita Ware carp and Qing Dynasty parrots. Augustus had a similar Chinese parrot in his collection, which may have served as inspiration and a reference. Meissen certainly borrowed from these pieces the practice of placing the animal on a rocky outcropping or tree stump as a means to support thin or fragile parts of the figure and to serve as its base. Candler depicts his porcelain animals in a moment in time where there is a suggestion of a narrative or at least some insight into their behavior or habitat. This objective scientific depiction combined with artistic interpretation was unprecedented in animal sculpture. In early modern Europe, large three-dimensional portrayals of animals were rare. The closest large-scale antecedent was the sculptures made for the fountains of the labyrinth at Versailles in the late 17th century. However, these were schematic allegorical renderings intended to illustrate fables rather than standalone sculptures. The nanny goat with Kid and her pendant, the billy goat at Dresden, offer a particularly strong example of how the mice and figures operate as companion pieces. We read the composition from left to right, beginning with the nanny goat who is licking and nursing her newborn calf. The billy goat looks on from the right in a pose that mirrors the nanny, and when they are placed next to each other, their eyes meet. So this tender moment between this family of goats can only be fully appreciated when they are displayed as a pair in this specific configuration. This pair of king vultures in the dining room originally came from a group of ten that were delivered to the Japanese palace. It's actually very unusual to see them arranged as companions outside of the Zwinger in Dresden because most collections only have one of the pair of figures. These imposing birds of prey left Dresden sometime in the 19th century, and Nelson Rockefeller acquired the pair in 1970 and placed them on this console table, flanking this 1917 portrait of his grandfather by John Singer Sargent. The vultures are perched on oak tree stumps festooned with leaves and acorns. They date to 1731, and they're known historically as the Kropfvogel, or crop bird. And this was one of the earliest models that Candler completed, and he most likely didn't study it from life, judging by its rather stiff appearance. Because the manufactory was still perfecting their porcelain recipe at the time, these very large cracks appeared in the stumps during firing. They were filled in at Meissen with a sealant paste that has darkened over time. One of the birds is marked with the number 9 inside of its stump, which specifies which clay recipe was used at the time. And in contrast to the previously discussed goats, the vultures do not have much interaction with each other or the immediate surrounding, but their poses do mirror each other, which lends a sense of harmony and symmetry to the decorative scheme in the room. Another king vulture presides over the room from this Victorian breakfast table in front of these north-facing windows. It's one of six vultures of this crouching model from the Japanese palace. The piece has an elaborate date mark inside its tree stump, which reads October 29, 1734. And this bird was studied from life by Candler. The other five vultures of this model were all painted and fired with enamels, like this example in Chicago. Oil paints may have been used to decorate this completely white piece, which are long gone. He describes it as a large Indian bird by the name of the King of Vultures, and that the pedestal is decorated with leaf work in the Indian fashion. Above the fireplace, on the opposite side of the room, is a more welcoming pair flanking a portrait of John D. Rockefeller Jr. These are Indian ringneck parakeets that Nelson acquired in the 1970s. Kendler recorded that he worked on the model in June of 1741 for Her Excellency, the Countess Moshinska, an Indian bird of suitable size, modeled from life in clay at her residence and presented sitting on a cherry bow, eating a little lump of sugar clasped in its claw. These are from a series of smaller animals that were not exclusive to the Japanese palace and could be sold by mice and to other patrons. They were also small enough to withstand firing with enamel glazes, hence these vivid colors. The bird on the right, who stands on the stump with cherries, has been identified as the male, and the female is at his left with the lump of sugar. 
Her stump is decorated with flowers, a snail, and a beetle. And the gilt bronze mounts were identified as Louis XV period French at the time they were sold to Nelson. Many of the mice and birds that passed through France were mounted this way by Parisian dealers in luxury goods called Marchand Mercier. It is interesting in this case how they serve to both elevate and anchor the two pieces together in the same way gilt wood frames would if they were painted pendants. Mrs. Jane Reitzman, a great patroness of the arts and collector, had a nearly identical pair of parakeets in her New York apartment. She also had an entire wall of mice and birds at her Palm Beach residence. Her collection is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. When we compare the vultures and parakeets to their real-life counterparts, we can really appreciate Meissen's great skill and achievement in capturing these animals as naturalistically as possible especially considering the limitations of the medium. The remaining mice and birds in Kaikit's dining room are on a slightly smaller scale. This lovely pair of doves, also known as nesting or drummer pigeons, are arranged on a wooden base that is not original and was added at the time of their installation. The female is seated on the right in a nest made of twigs and loose feathers. Her white plumage is accented by maroon and gray enamel. The male is perched on a mossy mound, and his feathers are accented in dark grays and purple, and he has these wonderful striped feet. At this corner of the room is a three-tiered dumbwaiter with a display of kingfishers and parrots. Very unusual for the pairings, which are typically separate figures, is this group at the top with two parrots perched together below a cherry tree surrounded by flowers and insects. This is one of only a few known examples of a model commissioned by Queen Maria Josepha, the wife of Augustus the Strong's successor. Candler recorded in 1745 that he modeled two Indian colored birds perched beside each other with a tree with cherries and other fruits. Below them sit another pair of parrots perched on white stumps adorned with turquoise and green leaves. The painting of these parrot figures was not always consistent or true to life, so many of them cannot be identified exactly, but these most closely resemble South American parrots. As exotic birds from faraway continents with the ability to talk, parrots were the most coveted species of birds for royal menageries. Unsurprisingly, parrots were among the most frequently reproduced birds at Meissen, and they are still highly sought after today. Meissen's small figures were meant to be admired at close range, and the painters really showed off their skill here in capturing different colors, textures, and finishes. These diminutive kingfishers below are sparrow-sized birds with long beaks. The female is this lighter blue color perched on a tall stump covered in green leaves, and the darker bird is the male who sits on a stump applied with leaves, reeds, and mushrooms. In looking at these figures, you can really get a sense of how much Candler must have delighted in studying and rendering nature. The little birds have their little tongues showing through their beaks like they're singing or talking to each other. There are insects crawling around, and they all look so alive. Mice and figures were extremely desirable in the 18th century because of their exoticness and rarity. And unlike other mice and wares, the animal figures are not tied to a particular artistic style or movement which has also resulted in their consistent high regard and value. Nelson's mice and purchases for Kaikit were very much in line with his family's preferences. Collecting and displaying mice and porcelain was a tradition before Nelson decided to don the dining room with duos. His mother, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, was a major collector who shared both her love of art and the natural world with her five sons. We know that Abby owned at least two pairs of mice and birds, which she displayed at 740 Park Avenue. Abby's sister, Lucy Truman Aldrich, was also a noted collector who gave her European porcelain collection to the RISD Museum, where they established the Lucy Truman Aldrich Porcelain Gallery. Lawrence and David Rockefeller assembled their own porcelain collections. Like their brother Nelson, they were particularly fond of mice and birds. David and his wife Peggy displayed them at Hudson Pines, their former estate here in Pecanico Hills. We can see a pair of mice and sparrowhawks on wall brackets, similar to how they would have been displayed in the 18th century. 
Interestingly, these gilt wall brackets actually came from the second floor of Kaikit. The birds are the same model that Abby had in her sitting room at 740 Park Avenue, which ended up with Lawrence in 1958. Lawrence's large and impressive collection of mice and birds was sold at auction at Sotheby's in 2005. Whether they are displayed in a dining room or a museum case, mice and animals continue to exert their powerful impact in pairs. I hope you'll keep a lookout for these amazing porcelain animals on your next visit to Kaikit, as well as their counterparts in other collections around the world. Thanks again for joining me, and we look forward to seeing you here soon. Thank you.